Good morning, everybody, and sure love you. Thank God for yet another day, and albeit hot as it might be, I'm thankful, and I'm just thankful for every one of you in the body of Christ at Pleasant View. All of those who are out there tuning in, no matter really where you're from or what body you might believe in, or I'm sorry, belong to, um, is that, you know, that we have the same Savior and believe in the same realities of what God has done for us. Today, what we're going to be talking about once again, we've been on the subject of forgiveness. And the last couple weeks, really just the awe, the, what the word is used in um, Psalms 130 is fear. But in the scripture, they talk about two types of fear. One is a fear of terror, and one is a fear that's described as love, honor, and respect towards the Lord. Which the love, honor, and respect, the service unto our Lord, is all due to the awe of God's love for us. For it is not that we first loved God, but that he first loved us. So on that note, let's have a word of prayer before we dive into the scriptures today. And once again, guys, just to assure all of your hearts, man, God has loved us. Uh, we love you. All of us from Pleasant View love you. Uh, we are fighting the good fight of faith, and we're doing it together, guys. We're not alone. And I just want to let you know, we are with you in spirit, and our prayers are always with you, and God is always with us all and keeps us unified. So let's go to the Lord in this word of prayer. Lord, I just come to you right now, Lord, and I just give you great thanks, Lord. And as I've been working on these classes, Lord, I just am amazed and sit in awe that your mercies have just continued to be there all the days of my life. And in fact, they will always endure. Lord, that your love and your forgiveness would be there, not only for the good, Lord, but for the sinners, for everyone in between. And in fact, Lord, you just want us all just to love you and believe you. So, Lord, I ask for your spirit to come down upon each and every one of us. And, Lord, that you would enlighten us and let us have the, your heart. Let us walk in your love and in your forgiveness. Let us live your words and hold on to them as our truth and not the things of this world, not the words of divisiveness and of hate of this world, but that we would live in the unity, in the love that you have given and purchased for each and every one of us. Amen. So today, class, we're going to be in, try to hit, God willing, we'll hit two different texts. Psalms 103, which we've been kind of touching on for the past few weeks, but I want to dive a little bit further into that text. And then I want us to jump over to a teaching of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 7. It's Luke chapter 7, and we'll start off at verse 36 when we get over there to Luke. But in Psalms 103, we're starting right off at verse 1 again. Now, I can't help but bring it up again, guys. That verse there, um, I already stated it, or brought it, I mentioned it, excuse me, a few minutes ago, but Psalms 130. But Psalms 130, verses 3 and 4, and he says, Lord, if you should even mark any of our iniquities, then who could stand? But instead there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And again, that fear is the awe that God would forgive us. Let go and not remember all of our iniquities, all of our sins. So in 103, a Psalm of David, he writes, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And that bless the Lord here. Uh, truthfully, the Lord blesses us, and it's impossible for us in that sense to bless the Lord by the same definition. But what it does mean is realize, realize all the blessings that God has had on us and on our soul, my soul. Bless the Lord with everything that's in, in the inner man. Man, let me just see all of God's blessings that he's had for me. Let me relish and live again in the awe of the, the shock, surprise, and amazement of God's love. He says, yes, all that is within me, bless His holy, His perfect, His complete essence, name, everything that makes up who God is. He says, yes, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. I think this is something that's really, really big. We're talking about our emotions that we go through. And we're talking about how to deal with those emotions and make sure that they're that we're using or utilizing living them in the correct manner 
So what Satan always tries to do is he always tries to cast us down. He always tries to, to get us to think less of ourselves. And if we fall into that, a lot of times we'll fall into judgment of others. Um, when we ourselves hurt, we try to hurt others. It's the natural reaction of the flesh and of the beast, of that me, mine, and I that Satan bit into. Um, I'm sorry, Satan got man to bite into. That we could be like God, knowing good, we know what's evil, we know what's right, we know what's wrong. The reality is, is that we don't. You know, what we call good and what we call evil is all based off of our judgments. And the reality is, is that God's judgments are the only ones that will matter in the end. Now, we've talked about things that make God angry. We talked about what they are referred to in the scriptures as the seven deadly sins. If you remember when we went over that, every single one of those was how man lives for themselves in a selfish nature, never being about others, always trying to divide and hurt others instead of bringing unification. Now, what God did was he had compassion upon every one of us, right? And he brought us together again to him. He redeemed us. So, in order to redeem us, though, our sins had to be taken away. So, let us not forget all the benefits. Verse 3, who forgives all of your iniquities? Guys, you know it's only the living God. You know, all the other gods that man has ever tried to create, dream up or anything else, guys, not the living God, the God over heaven and earth, the creator of all things. Well, for him, he's the only God who could forgive us of all of our iniquities. And he has done that through his son, Jesus Christ. Who is it that has healed our infirmities? Well, Again, it's the Lord God, the living God. Who redeems your life from destruction? Who has bought back your life from the destruction that you were headed on? You know, guys, every single one of us born into this world, born into sin and death. And if we stay in that path of this world, it will only take us to destruction in the end, hell itself. And yet God desired something better for us that he bought us back. He paid the full price through the blood of his only begotten son, that we ourselves could be purchased back from that death, from sin, having paid for it all. Now, you think about all of our sins and what we justly deserve. And what we justly deserve is God's wrath. But instead, our God, verse 4, who crowns you? Who places on your head? Not the burden. See, God doesn't want us to live burdensome. He doesn't want us to live cast down. He doesn't want us to live under all of those negative, negative things that sometimes we ourselves place on us, and sometimes it's those around us who place those kind of charges. In fact, it says that He places on us loving kindness. Kindly, always loving us. That's He puts that on our minds and on our hearts in tender mercies. Not giving us what we deserve and doing it gently, tenderly. He says, who satisfies your mouth with good things? You know, who satisfies your mouth? You know, generally, guys, um, the dissatisfaction of the things of this world causes a lot of those emotions, whether it be depression, anger, sadness, fear. A lot of those different things come from us feeling dissatisfied. So who is it that satisfies Every bit. You know, guys, it's only the Lord who satisfies. We never found that satisfaction in anything. I, I don't think that's the right word. Um, but we've never fa found ourselves to be satisfied by the things of this world. You know, many of us have tried. We've tried to do it through relationships. We've tried to do it through our children. We've tried to do it through our husbands or our wives. We've tried to do it through money, through buying or purchasing certain items. And you realize, guys, all of those things. So there was the beast, the me, my, and I, who became dissatisfied seeing something else that they thought was more valuable, not trusting God in his value system or agreeing with God in his value system. Now, this happens, guys, and so don't nobody go into, you know, again, the self-condemnation. That's what we don't want. We want everybody relieved from that self-condemnation. Excuse me, I just dropped my pen. Uh, we don't want everybody to fall into those things. No, we want us to find that satisfaction, but it's in the Lord. That's where we become satisfied. It's not in the things of this world. Many of us have sought it, and we fell, we fall, we fell short. But no, who satisfies that for ourselves? 
And it is God who gives those good, godly things His words, His faith, His mercies, His forgiveness, His loving kindness. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. Then He also, for those who worship Him, He also provides tons of other things, right? Monetarily. But guys, you know, the most valuable of all of them really are the spiritual things. He says that, so that your mouth, is, or sorry, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. And you know, guys, um, getting to see an eagle just soar through the air, it's like so elegant, like they're not even using any, any, any energy at all. I watch my kids sometimes, and they just fly all over the place. And it's like, man, you know, just the, all of that energy. And I know that at one point in time, I had that, but I don't know where it went. The reality is, is when God's words... When God's realities are all over me, man, I do have it. I do have that energy. Now, it's not the same, maybe. Maybe I'm not running up and down stairs and can play for seven, eight hours straight and just run back and forth um, like I used to be able to. But you know what? I don't feel as beat up, cast down, as burdened when I'm under the realities of who God is and what He has done. So let us never forget all of His benefits. Now he goes on, he says, Now that the Lord executes righteousness and justice for those who are oppressed. So remember, when we're going through these different emotions, that sometimes we feel like we need to be the judge, we need to be the jury, and we need to be the executioner. But let us remember that it is the Lord who will execute his righteousness, his judgment, his justice for all who are oppressed. Now God's ways of doing that is not our ways. And many, many times uh, we would like... I was thinking about a movie popped into my mind and the old boy says that, you know, that he wanted God's vengeance to come. And I think it was a pastor in the movie and he says, don't worry, God will take his. And he says, well, it's fine just as long as he hurries up so I can see it. And the reality is, is that is us, right? We want that self-satisfaction and we want it right now. Um, if we feel hurt, we want that strike right back and we want to see it. And even if we are going to say, okay, well, God, you said that you would take vengeance, then God, I want to see that come. Well, sometimes it doesn't come right away. In fact, sometimes God's way is actually that soul being saved. And then they themselves become servants of the Lord, worshiping Him. Now, guys, really deep down in our heart, that is what we should desire for every person out there. We really should desire that. Now, sometimes in the moment, that's hard to do. Sometimes we are so caught up in our own emotions but the reality is, is that God does execute His righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He will do so in His time. Now He says He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. We can relate that right back to verse 6 in the example here. For it was the people who were oppressed during that period of time, being under the slavery of of, of the king. And as we remember, Moses comes in, brings the message of God, and eventually the people are let go. Now, what happens to those who were trying to oppress is they continue after them to destroy them, and God himself swallows them up in the Red Sea after the, his people had made their way through. Now, it says his acts to the children of Israel... The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not, though, always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Now, I kind of want to relate all of this back together in that same story of Moses real quick. And I want to cry more of a warning. Now, here there's some beautiful, beautiful things as far as how the Lord does not um, deal with us uh, based off of our sins. In fact, he doesn't even punish us according to any of our twisted ways, our iniquities. In fact, what God's judgment will come upon is the unbelief. So here he says, man, the Lord will execute his righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Now you think about that though. The children were led out of slavery. They were led into the wilderness, right? Now, this, as we know, there was, what is it, the cloud who kept, that kept them cool during the day. 
the pillar of fire that kept them safe and warm at night. There was manna that came down from heaven, the quail that they just had to open up um, their arms and they would catch them. Uh, so God took care of them. A rock that was giving them water that followed them throughout the desert. Again, God made his ways known. He gave instruction for them to love each other, to love him and to follow his instructions. Now the people, though, went away from his instructions. That generation, many of them did. And they oppressed those who wanted to believe and wanted to stand on the truths of God. They themselves also, God, he says, he will not always strive with us. So God was slow to anger and he abounded in his mercies for every single one of them. Every one of them were able to experience his ways and his love. But even though they had experienced them and knew them, they had the knowledge thereof, the execution, the believing them was a whole nother story. We find, in fact, that they build an altar to a false god. They create a golden image to worship. When they get to the land of milk and honey, they refuse to enter it by his command and by his word. And instead, they want to continue living in the wilderness and in their little lives, their ways. So he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. In fact, in that moment, he swore upon his wrath that none of them would enter his rest. However, he also made the promise for the next generation that they would believe and that they would enter in. Now, he did not deal with them, though, according to their sins. If it was about their sins, if it was about their iniquities, then God wouldn't have even led them out of Egypt in the first place. In fact, they would have just stayed there in that captivity and died. But God wanted God wanted his words. He wanted his truths to be there. Again, man, who forgives like our God? Who heals like our God? Who redeems? Who crowns? Who satisfies like our God? You know, guys, there is no other. But do not misunderstand. For those who will live their lives in unbelief, there will come a day when God's anger will not be withheld anymore. But the fact is, is that God does not desire that. He does not desire that for any man. And I think that these things are important for us to remember when we're dealing with our emotions. When we go to that place of meditating upon the Lord and on His name. As we're praying and communing with Him for each other, for ourselves, for the brethren, and for this world. It's important for us to remember both sides of this. That one is how greatly God has loved us. But then also that for those who, whether it is rejecting the message, omitting God's words and his promises and his declarations, or if it's just neglecting to ever do anything with them, maybe seeing them and recognizing them, but never really doing anything with it. Man, guys, you know, I don't want anyone to stay there because you know what? God doesn't want anybody to stay there. He didn't want you to stay there and he didn't want me to stay there. Now, he's brought his words. Now, the fact is, though, guys, is he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he punish us according to our iniquities. He wants us delivered from them all. And he wants us to live blessed and delivered from them all. In verse 11, he says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Mercy, not giving us what we deserve. How much mercy? Well, how high are the heavens above the earth? How far do they go? How much distance is there? You guys, I can't remember how many millions, billions of miles that now we have discovered that are the universes that exist and we still have not reached the tip of any of it. And yet at the same time, God's mercies, then they are so much greater than anything in this world. They are, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Now that fear again, guys, there's that word again. That fear, that awe, uh, that creates that love, honor, and respect. Oh my gosh, God yet loves me. I did this. I messed up. I'm a sinner. I deserve God's wrath. But man, God has loved me. Now think about that when we're in a state of being depressed. 
in that state, what we're focused on is ourselves, usually. Usually what we're looking at is all of the things that we are not and we're not doing. Um, a lot of times, again, some will reinforce that and they will point out our failures and our shortcomings. That only creates a greater burden many times. What we must do, though, is meditate on the Lord and on His words and on His commandments and what His works his wonderful works, the good news, the good tidings of the Lord. Now think about that. The mercy. Have we messed up? Yes, we've messed up. Are we short? Yes, we are short. So that recognition, that was, I think it was two weeks ago, um, the recognition that we are sin, that we are sinners, that we have this flesh, and the penalty that we would justly deserve is God's wrath. But God chose to have mercy on us. And guys, really every person that's in this world, Solomon writes about this in the book of Proverbs, but it comes upon, it's there for everyone. Right now in this day of grace, that's for everyone. Now, for us then, to have mercy, to see it that way, to see that no, we are not to judge, for in fact, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Well, what about the condemnation of others? So, anger. And a lot of times, guys, these different emotions kind of piggyback off of themselves. But that emotion of anger. And he says what to do with that anger is, is that we go and we meditate on the Lord and on His works. Think about that. You know, man, we're upset, we're angry, somebody, offense has come to our, to our door. But it also, the scripture also says that the Lord knocketh on the heart of man, the doors of man's heart. And he just wants us just to open up and let him in, right? So in that meditation, pray for the Spirit to help us open up our heart's door to the love of God and see the mercy that God's had on us. And to love God back. Because see, if we can love God back, then we can love others. In fact, guys, the transgressions, the places where we crossed over and we did it wrong, God yet loves us and removed that sin. And if he removed it for us, the sin and the transgression of another, he has also then removed. So let's praise him in this. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. As far as the east is from the west. So, comprehension of this, guys, as far as you go east and you continue to go east, guess what you will always continue to do? You will always continue to go east. So what you will never find is an end to the east because the world will continue to go around and around. So how far has he removed that transgression? You know what? If you were looking for it, if it was God, he can't even find it anymore. That's how good, that's how perfectly Jesus Christ took it away. So let's go the opposite direction. Go to the west. Look for it there. Well, as far as you go, you'll continue and you'll continue to go west. Around and around and around. And you will never find it. Not in God's eyes. Because Jesus Christ has removed those transgressions once and for all. Therefore, God's mercies can be greater than any transgression that ever has transpired and ever will transpire. So, the Lord looks at us and He sees us and He has pity upon us as His own dear children. In fact, it says, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. Again, that word, that awe, the love, man, the honor, the respect, the desire to love Him back because, wow, how much has He loved us, guys? How perfectly has He paid and atoned for your sins? Man, if he's done it, guys, man, rejoice with me right now. Now, that word pity, it means a feeling of sorrow. A feeling of sorrow which causes compassion to take place because someone else is suffering. Because someone else is suffering, compassion takes place, and it's a feeling. That pity is a feeling. God feels pity for us, his children. For he understands the suffering that we go through in this life. See, sometimes when we're in that suffering, we think that we're all alone. 
Sometimes when we're in that depression, we feel like we're all alone. Sometimes when we're in our anger, we feel all alone. The sad part is, is again, the nature of man is, is that if we feel that, we usually try to cause it to others. Recognize God. He does not want us to feel that sorrow. No, he does not want that suffering to be passed on to another, so he moves with compassion. He moves to remove the problem. The problem is this beast, this flesh, and our sins, and our ideology that we know what's right and what's wrong. So how does God go about removing that? He does it through His Son, Jesus Christ. But the reality is, guys, is we are still just yet mere men. Let us be in awe of His love. But God, He does know us. And He pities us. And it says, for He knows our frame. He knows what we're made up of. He knows. He says, then He remembers that we are but dust. From the dust we came and from the dust we will return. It was He that breathed life into us. We were made in His image. He knows what makes us up. He knows what manner of man or woman or child you are. Whatever you consider yourself, He knows exactly what you are and how He made you. He knows your weaknesses and He knows your strengths. And see, the thing is, is that He's not bothered by either one. Not He Himself. Your strengths, He wants to use them. He wants you to see. Yes, you justly deserve His wrath, but He is not wanting to give that to you. Instead, He has given, provided for you the forgiveness of your sins through Jesus Christ. So grab a hold of Jesus and love Him. Love Him for His forgiveness and stand in awe all the days of our lives. Let's always love our Lord. For we are nothing but dust. Excuse me. But He has loved us like jewels. Precious, precious jewels. He knows what we are. He knows what we contend with. He also knows that the sin that Adam bit into, that cast all of us into that sin and death. He understands. And He cares. And He's had compassion on us. For as for man, his days are like grass. Verse 15. For as a flower of the field sprouts up in all of its glory, it flourishes the beauty of of the flowers of the, of the fields, guys. But the fact is, is that the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place even remembers it no more. God understands that this life is short. It is a sweet little morsel of time, guys, that we have the opportunity to hear what God has done for us and His love for us. To believe upon our Lord and confess Him as our Lord and Savior. And to follow Him and walk in this life. He knows that this life bears many, many struggles and He gives us His words as direction and encouragement and exhortation so that we can deal with these things and continue in the walk of faith and be found to be those good and faithful servants. He understands that this little moment of time is all that we have. And while we may only have this little bit, His mercy is everlasting. So this little life, we only have a little. But His mercy is everlasting. In fact, it is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear God. Him. And for those who fear Him, His righteousness, His righteousness is provided, and not only to you, but even your children's children. What a promise. He says to those that this is for those who keep His covenant, and to those who remember His commandments and to do them. So what are the main commandments of the Lord? 
They are to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And they are also to love one another. So why do we make it so hard? God has poured out his love. Guys, man, the wrath that we deserve, the judgment that we deserve justly, we deserve that from him. Instead, God loved us and provided us righteousness through his son, Jesus Christ, once and for all, the covenant of the payment, the atonement for our sins. God has loved us. He has forgiven you of all of your sins. And he wants you to believe him today and be free from all of them, to live free. He says, if I set you free, then you're free indeed. Now, guys, it doesn't mean that we don't go through these emotions. But let us have pity. Let us be moved with compassion for those who do not believe yet. And let us share with them the wonderful good tidings that has been shared with us. And sometimes we do. We need to find that quiet place. We need to meditate upon the Lord. We need to recognize what we are. We need to recognize what God has done for us. We need to praise Him for it. And then we need to recognize that God has a purpose. And that purpose is always for the salvation of others. Let me check my time here. Oh my goodness. We have burned through it. Luke chapter 7, guys, why do we make it so hard? Why do we make it so hard, guys? Well, sometimes it is, is because we need to see the debt that we owe. We need to understand. We need to see what manner of man we are. The reason sometimes we fall into our angers, our judgments, is because we forget. We forget what we are and we think somebody else is lower than us. Or we feel such great guilt and judgment, deceit from this world of how nasty we are, so we try to justify ourselves by condemning others. No matter what the reason for that part is, there's a story that Jesus teaches, and I want to try to cover it, and I've only got about five or ten minutes here, so I'm going to try to cover it real quick. So excuse me for paraphrasing so much of this, and maybe if the Spirit leads it, um, we'll come back to this one, but I already had another one lined up for next week. But this is just really, guys, staying in that awe, that love of the Lord. To love Him and to love one another. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36. What it is here is that there was a Pharisee, a Pharisee named Simon, who had asked Jesus to come to his house. Now think about that. This man who has the words of God, who has been trained in the biblical scriptures, has knowledge of all of these promises and all of these words. Everything that we just read in Psalms. Like this man would have known him. And this man asks for Jesus to come to his house to sit down and eat with him. And it says, Behold, that there was a woman who was a sinner, and she knew, when she, once she knew that this was Jesus, once she recognizes who he is, she immediately goes and gets an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and she goes and stands before him, falls down at his feet, weeping. And she begins to wash his feet with her tears. How honored are you that Christ stands at your heart's door and knocks? Are you honored enough to fall down on your feet? Sorry, guys. Uh, it doesn't help with time when i got to try to choke back those tears. But with her tears, she washed his feet. She wiped away those tears with her own hair. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, excuse me again. Oh my gosh, the awe that she was in to realize her Lord and Savior, the one that she had heard of, that was going to take away all of her sins, who was going to pay for them so that she would not have to, that she could live forgiven of all of her sins. And she's so overwhelmed in that awe, she falls down and starts worshiping the Lord, crying. She serves him 
washes his feet, the most dirtiest, nastiest things. You know, they wore sandals everywhere. They lived in a place in temperature-wise that was similar to Arizona. They walked everywhere that they went pretty much. So the dirt, you could just imagine, the sweat, all of those different things. And she, in humbleness, falls down at his feet with her tears pouring out. I can't imagine the amount of tears that that young lady lost right there. And yet I kind of think I can because there's been moments where the Lord has humbled me in such a way. It says, now when the Pharisee seen that Jesus was letting this woman touch him, he thought in his heart, he says, you know what, man, if he really was a prophet, then he would know what manner of this woman was and she, he wouldn't even let her touch him. Now Jesus, knowing and perceiving his thoughts, says to him, she, he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he says, well, then teacher, go ahead and say it. And he says, well, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Now, one denarii was considered a one day's wage. So 500 was considered about over a little bit over a year and a half's worth of wages. And there was another man who owed 50 denarii. Now, this 50 would have been about a month and a half, a little bit over. So, neither one could repay. Neither one had the money to pay back the debt. And so the creditor freely forgives them, freely forgives them of both of them, of their debts. So Jesus asks Simon, he says, so you tell me which one will love this creditor more? Which one will love him more? Well, Simon says, I suppose the one who was forgiven of more. So if you're having a hard time forgiving someone else, maybe you should ask yourself, how much have you been forgiven of? Is it real that you're really forgiven? And boy, guys, if it's not to anybody out there, I'm going to give this, this one real quick. Man, call us. Our number is 602-276-7815. Call us. We will get back with you. We will have a prayer. We will establish your faith. We will encourage, exhort. We will teach you. We will call you to faith. And if we can, we will get our hands on you and we will get you baptized so you know that God has covered, paid for all of your sins. I just love you. God has loved you. For the truth is, guys, is we owe way more than a year and a half or a month and a half. We owe way more than a lifetime. For our sins are greater than what we could ever even comprehend. They really are. Greater than what we could ever really see. Therefore, if we see the sins of others, let us remember our sins and the debt that was forgiven to us. For Jesus answered, he says, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and he says to her, do you see? I'm sorry. He turned to the woman and then he says to Simon, do you see this woman? He says, for I entered your house. You invited me, right? You knew me. You knew what I'm here for. You know the scriptures. And so you invite me into your house. You had knowledge. And you even invited. But you didn't, you didn't even give me any water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her own tears. She was in such awe and love of me. In fact, she even wiped them dry with the hair off of her own head. You did not greet me with a kiss. You weren't even happy enough to see me, to give me a kiss on the cheek. Heck, she was in the floor kissing my feet. Oh my goodness, you would not even place oil on my head. But she used the whole bottle of fragrant oil on my feet. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are completely forgiven. For she has loved much. But to whom, to whom they believe that only a little is forgiven... So the same, the same way, 
they can only love a little. So he says to her, your sins are forgiven you. And some who were there say, man, who is this who says that their sins can be forgiven? And he says to the woman, your faith, your reality, your reality, your reality of what you are and what you deserve and who God is and what he has done for you. That he's given you me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right here in this moment. For all of you out there, he's given him to you right here in this moment. Be at peace. Go in peace. Believe the Lord. He says, for it is your faith. Your faith has saved you. So live in peace. Know God loves you. Boy, church, know God has loved you and love him back. Oh, how forgiven are you? Title of today's class, and I should have said that probably at the beginning. I don't think I did. How forgiven are you? So why do we make it so hard? Why do we make it so hard to forgive others? When it frees us and allows us to live in peace, when God wants us to live in that peace and He has forgiven us, He's provided, purchased it for us. Who has a God like our God? Oh my. I'm so thankful for Him. Excuse me. I'm so thankful for Him, for His love and His forgiveness of my sins. I'm so thankful of His love and His forgiveness for all of yours. I have to close class out. I'm over my time. I love you. God loves us. Boy, church, let's live. Wake up in the morning. Take that walk. Remember those sermons. Take that walk, guys, up Golgotha. Know that He carried that burden for you. You don't have to carry it anymore. You can really let go and be at peace. You can really resign to the fact that God loves you because He really has. He wants good things for you, guys. And oh, it's Satan. It's the deceiver that wants you under those burdens. He really has delivered them from you. And guys, if you need that, if you need to have that conversation, sometimes we just need to get it up and out of us, that confession which leads us unto salvation. Guys, man, if you need that deliverance, call us. Call me. Text me. I love you. I'm for you. I'll take the time, guys. You know, some in the past say, have said, Roger, but you're so busy, I don't want to bother you. You know what? Baloney. Call me. Reach out to me. I love you. I'm for you. The Lord has loved us. He is for us. He has given us one another. Believers in the same finished work. So let us live in awe. Let us take that walk and let us live on the right side of the tomb. I love you all. I pray that you guys have a blessed Sunday in the sermon that you're about to hear right after this class, guys, that it would bless each and every one of your hearts, that you would be uplifted, live in the victories that God has provided. No, we don't always know what they're going to be and how they're going to work out, but God has provided them once and for all. Let us close in a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you for your awesome love, Lord, and for your forgiveness, Lord, that you would forgive us of all of our debt, all of our sin, Lord. And Lord, I look forward to that day that we can and we will be before you when every tongue confesses that you are Lord and Savior and that we that believed, Lord, that fought the good fight of faith can kneel before you and place our crown for only art thou worthy. Amen.